Hi, I'm Jeff, lead pastor of Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And this podcast is where I get a chance to interview people about things that I'm interested in and talk about whatever I want to talk about. Welcome back. Once again, my name is Levi. I'm the producer of the show. Uh, You are joining us for our pre-conversation conversation where Jeff and I will riff about a few things going on in the world that we're interested about. Right, Jeff? I'm so interested in about it. Oh, in yeah. It. About there it. some uh, big things happening these days. All right. You're the one who scours social media to find out what's happening in the world. Levi, before you scour the social media, are you so connected that you know what's happening in the world? I am tremendously unconnected to the world. <laughs> I, I, I think the word's disconnected. But you know what? We'll make it unconnected. I uh, used to be far more connected, and then when I started working here, I realized I spent too much time on social media. Yes. Well, Twitter is a black hole. Yes. So I'm back on Twitter basically just because of this podcast. Okay. Well, that's not good. It's like, well, I, I went back to drinking, so <laughs> maybe not. It's a, it's a good parallel. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, have you been on Twitter? I have. <laughs> it's a lot of drunk. I think control. a lot of people on there. I was going to say, it's better when you drink, I guess. <laughs> Okay, uh, the first thing, people are upset at the Catholic Church for mm. maintaining a doctrine it has held for a long time. Uh, specifically, they affirmed a more traditional understanding of marriage, and people are not happy about it. Well, you know, it's the, when you say they, I think what they've been wanting is that Pope Francis has, bec- he is quite a social justice type of guy. Mm. And so I think that a lot of people have expected him at some point during his pope and popishness Papacy. Papacy. To come out and say, look, I don't, you know what, the church has taught this for a long time, but this is not right, and we have come to our senses in this day and age, and, but he doesn't, but he gives these hints every once in a while, people try to read into it, and then, then he comes out and he doesn't, and it's, what's crazy about the, is the news seems to cover it like it's a shock, right? Breaking! Pope remains Catholic! You, and it's, uh, it's bizarre to me. Like I, I, I genuinely think that that many of the news organizations and many people who are secularists in the world think that their worldview is like it's like an acid that's re- going to eat through everything, and eventually everybody's going to be you know be this way. It's like the Borg just absorb it all in, right? Those are two different things, acid and the Borg. But I like the Borg better. Remember the Borg? I do not remember Star the Trek. Borg. What? That well, that dates me now. They have new Star Trek, so I just haven't watched. The Borg is this like, yeah, everybody gets kind of sucked into it, and they all become one, one, one a mind, mm. the hive mind. Yeah. That anyway, I mm. I have no desire to explain Star Trek references, unless I pull up a Star Trek news story that we <laughs> yeah, have to talk, which I won't because I'm not particularly invested in Star Trek either. Yeah. Uh, you think there's anything else coming up that people are going to expect the Catholic Church to to waver on? Well, I think some people have been wanting them to change their mind on abortion for a long time, mm. and they remain indignant against it, which is good. Which is good. The Roman Catholic Church is interesting because they are, uh, you know, more than Protestant churches. They tend to, you know, because they speak with one, one voice. Ultimately, the the Pope is seen as the, as the vicar of Christ, the the God's representative on the earth, and so when he speaks, uh, people take it a lot more seriously. People in the wider culture take it a, a lot more seriously. Uh, and so I think if if the Pope went the other direction, it would be a huge splash. What's crazy about it is Joe Biden has said that he disagrees with the Pope hmm. about this, and yet he's he's you know he's been called a um, you know a, a committed Catholic, hmm. which is weird to me because you know Levi, what you call somebody who uh, disagrees with the Roman Catholic dogma. And instead, believe something different. That they basically protest against the dogma, and instead they believe something else. That is called a Protestant. Yeah, <laughs> some version of one. Yes. So I don't. Uh, it's interesting how the Roman Catholic Church is functioning these days. You have a lot of people who don't believe the church is teaching, but they remain Catholic. I think when they say they're Catholic, they mean it in a more of a social, right, historical. 
way, meaning my family was part of that. But right. Like they check it on a census. Yeah, but Joe but Biden's been, I mean, that's the way that people have, uh, you know, sh- shown him to be. Hmm. Um, that's their, That's the way they purport him to be. So okay. it's interesting, real challenge for him. Yeah, so that's big on this podcast. The Catholic Church is still the Catholic Church. Yeah. You heard it here first. First. The other thing we want to talk about at the start of uh, this little pre-conversation conversation is uh, completely disconnected from the Catholic Church. March Madness. Jeff, you follow college <laughs> well, There's basketball. a lot of Roman Catholic schools that are in there. Well, that's true. Right? So here, here's my link with the Roman Catholic ch- Church. Mm-hmm. Gonzaga. <laughs> Gonzaga is the number one overall seed in March Madness, and they will win it. This year, do you know they haven't lost, like, games for... They, they, they've won most games by over 10 points. They're a juggernaut. They're undefeated. Are they the Pope's favorite team? Well, I don't know. But you know, like Loyola Marymount and Gonzaga and, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of Catholic schools that basically, Notre Dame, they they all get in the tournament. And so, yeah, I find myself cheering for Gonzaga, though, because I'm from Seattle and they are from kind of Spokane or the other side of the state, and they're good. And mostly the college basketball teams I support usually aren't good. So apparently you're a big fan of the uh, the the North Carolina Tar Heels. Tar Heels. I yeah. am. Yeah, I have a practice of not watching any college basketball during the regular season, and then dipping in and out of the right. tournament. And yet every year I fill out a bracket, completely uninformed, anyways, and just find the Tar Heels and select them to win each round, all the way through. That a boy. That's good. It has not panned out in the last... No, not for several years. A bunch of years. And it probably won't pan out this year because no. they're a bit of a lower seed. Yeah. Let me give you a piece of advice with the brackets, mm-hmm. okay? You always want to pick a 12 over a 5. You got So if you pick all the 12s over 5s, you will probably get two or three of them right. That mm-hmm. is the matchup. That historically, 12s over 5s. Big deal. That would have been good a couple of days ago. Yeah. That but I submitted my bracket. Oh, uh, Okay. Yeah, a lot of people, is it ca- Canadians like to submit the bracket, do they? Yeah, a bunch of guys on staff, I think, have okay. all submitted brackets. That's good. Okay, so i got to tell you, in my family, uh, because we're American and I grew up watching March Madness, um, and, you know, there's a song at the end, One Shining Moment. It's not over until you watch One Shining Moment after the, after the, the, the final. But I don't think in Canada you had that. Maybe they didn't carry that. It's a song, an old song that they put a bunch of clips to. But anyway, my kids, I'm, I don't make my kids go to school on Thursday or Friday of March Madness. If I mean, my daughter doesn't care, uh, and so she's, she goes. But like, if, if school is on during those days, I won't, I don't, they don't have to go. That and U.S. Thanksgiving, those are the two, the two holidays that I insist they, they keep. Because March Madness is the best two, well, best four days of of sports are the four days, the first four days of March Madness. Because it's wall-to-wall basketball, hmm. right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter. You, all you're doing is looking at the top of the screen to see if, who's close. And then you go to the close game and hope that there's a buzzer beater. And there usually is. Hmm. So That's a good pro tip on the uh, 12 seed over the 5 yep, seed. Yep, absolutely. In the future, you need to... Keep yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. We'll do. Yeah, mm-hmm. anything else is just kind of unwise to pick those. Yeah, upsets. you need to go with the Big Ten this year too because they're fantastic. Okay, but you already did your stupid bracket. I so. already did. But if you're waiting to do your bracket, which of course you're not, because this is <laughs> coming out before that, after that, so uh, go Tar Heels. We talked about the Catholic Church, talked about Catholic basketball schools, and now we're going to get into Jeff's interview with uh, Trevor Thronis. He's a part of our church, owns a business where he coaches other business leaders. So he has some really insightful things to say that we think you'll really benefit from. Well, I'm here with Trevor Thronis. He is the CEO of his own company. Trevor, if you have your own company, do you just name yourself CEO? Is that how that works? You try to pick the most prestigious title you can, for sure. And do you call yourself the CEO? Yeah, or king. Yeah. CEO, king, whichever. Um, how many employees do you have? Uh, well, I've got uh, a couple of um, uh, full-time employees, and then I've got a whole bunch of part-time outsource people. Okay. What do you do? Like, what is your business? I work with companies that are in fast growth, and I help them figure out how to plot a way forward in growth. Right. So you, I asked you to come along so because I have been greatly helped by your uh, 
teaching in your book, uh, Getting People Right. Am I right about that? Power of People Skills. That is the yeah, name of the book, know, and Getting People Right is the name of your company. Either is fine, really. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about some of the stuff that has helped me in terms of leadership and uh, stuff with staff. I find myself in many circumstances where I'm talking to somebody, whether it's a pastor or a business leader, that I, I find myself actually giving them advice that's actually your advice. And then they end up thinking I'm brilliant because they're like, you know, that I, that I get contacted later. You know, that was really helpful what you said about how you should do that. Did, is that just something that you learn and then I have to cite you? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm sure I just stole it from somebody else. <laughs> no, too, you so didn't. Don't worry about it. No, you are a super helpful guy. And I wanted to help people who are in business or who are uh, in leadership of any kind learn how to get along with other people because it seems to be that that's the way it always falls apart. You know, one thing that I've found is, you know, I've met with so many business leaders over the past 20 years in coffee shops and restaurants. And when you sit down, inevitably it turns to people first. So, you know, if you go home at night, you can't sleep at night, uh, you're talking to your spouse about an issue. It's a people issue, like every time, pretty much. It is. Relational breakdown yes. of some of some level. Or yes. Usually, I imagine the reason most people leave their workplaces is either they can't stand their boss, they can't stand their employees, or they have to work with people who they think are being treated in ways that they shouldn't be treated, meaning this guy who's a jerk is being treated really well, and I'm sick of it. Right. Yeah, the old saying is, you know, people join companies and leave supervisors or <laughs> lead, leave teams. Yeah, yeah. So you need to tell me a little bit about yourself, though. Where are you from? Uh, where did you, you're a Christian man. I am. So uh, where where did you come to faith in Christ? You have a background, I think, is in the church. Yeah, my I come from a pastor's family. Uh, my mom led me to the Lord. There's never been a time in my life that I have not had faith in Christ, like thanks be to God. And I grew up in, or born in Fort St. John, grew up in Edmonton, moved out here in the, in the 80s with my family and uh, with some brief sojourns to the, to the prairies. I've been here ever since. Where in the prairies did you sojourn? Uh, Edmonton. Lived in Edmonton for a long time. I, my dad was a pastor of Sherwood Park Alliance Church for a long time, yeah. and then Chilliwack Alliance for a long time. That's great. But you, you spurned the pastoral work, your inherited birthright. Yeah. I, you know, I actually got into the family business <laughs> first, so I was uh, of that generation that spent, you know, five mandatory nights at the church every week, yeah. which was great, by the way. You never had to interact with, you know, with the, 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 uh, the people on the outside. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I went and got a degree in religious education. I became a youth pastor for a while for a variety of reasons. At some point, I just felt like I'd stood in the wrong line, nothing to do with faith, nothing to do with Christ. And I got into the business world. So when you first got in the business world, what were you doing? You didn't start this right away. No, no. You know, I started, I had a very interesting story. I just showed up at a guy's uh, a house who owned a significant business and a, a friend of a friend told me to do this and I cold called him. I rang his, you know, the, the doorbell on his gate and he said, why should I let you in? And I had a script and he let me in and I spent the whole day with him and he preached and harangued and on Monday I was working for him. That's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you do this with, did you try to do this with other people like Michael Jordan or no, Kobe Bryant? No, he was Bryant? the only one. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. I needed a job and, uh, you know, it was not the traditional If he can just path. meet me, then he will hire me. And he did. Yes, he did. He did. He did. Well, you're, you're like a leech that way, Trevor. The first day I showed up, I said, where do I sit? And he said, well, you can sit across from me and my desk. What do you want me to do? What's my job? Go wash my truck. So I did that and that's where it started. That's great. Yeah. When did you get the idea, though, that you wanted to kind of break out you know, onto your own and start something that had to do with, with people? What was the process that came, came to your consulting? Right. Well, I'd done this for 14 years. So I'd been a pastor for seven. I'd been in the business world for seven. And I realized that I love both. I love pastoring people. I love walking alongside people, that whole piece of it. Uh, and I love working on the business side. And I had this vision in my mind that I wanted to be a business pastor, which is kind of what I am. Although a lot of people who I work with are not believers, but they don't know it, but I actually am kind of a pastor to them. Yeah. Well, I imagine that they end up giving you all sorts of insight. When I mean, you talk about people, right? You end up talking about spouses and you talk yeah, about... it's always personal. <laughs> right. So, uh, Trevor, um, what exactly do you do? Like people well, hear the yeah. word consultant. By the way, all business people use that language now. 
I'm a consultant and really? I never know what the next question is because I'm like, oh, okay, what huh? do you like? What do you do on a right. Monday? It means they got fired, and so you know anybody can be a consultant. Just get a business card. You're a consultant. Right. There is no you know school that you have to have or you know anything behind your name. So what I do is I work with companies in four different areas. First, I work with them in people, getting right people in right seats, solving chronic people issues, because who always comes before what? If you don't have the people stuff, nothing else works. Then we do a strategy piece. So then we figure out what does our culture look like? What are our goals? And so on. We put that on one page, which we've done here at Northview. Then third, we talk about what do we measure? Because what gets measured gets done. We don't want you to run out of cash. When you're in growth, growth sucks cash. So you got to watch the cash. And then finally, we talk about alignment and communication. How do we get everybody talking and communicating around the same thing? So every heart is beating in the same direction, pushing blood in the same direction. We're all trying to achieve the same goals. Which one of those four is the most difficult to achieve? Oh, the people by far. Uh, you know, that's actually, I, you mentioned that I wrote a book. I wrote a book on that because that is the thing that has to come first. If the people part isn't right, the strategy doesn't matter. You can't align people around, you know, uh, around the wrong leaders and, uh, the measurement doesn't matter because it's all about the people first. So how Trevor, do I give, give me some advice if I'm a leader and I'm involved in a business and I have some staff who are, who are not, you know, I struggle to work with them and stuff like that. How, right. how do I bring them along? What should I do with them? Do you find, do you find that people, that leaders in, in businesses and churches and stuff are far too patient with their people or impatient with their people? Well, okay. So let's start first by saying that in any relational breakdown, everybody owns something. So it's never a hundred percent to zero percent. So my first suggestion would be to say, what am I doing? What do I need to own in the, in the breakdown of this relationship? Like what part is mine? So if you're a boss, you know, are you setting the person up to fail? Are you telling them exactly what they need to do to win? Are you giving them regular feedback? Do you have them in the right role? Uh, do they have the training and coaching that they need? If you're an employee and you feel like your boss is difficult, you know, are, are you doing everything you can to be indispensable? Like, do you show up early? Do you stay late? Are you just mailing it in? Uh, what part do you own? That's, that's question one, I think, mm -hmm. because especially when you're a leader, nobody is going to, uh, uh, you know, go higher than you. So if you show up and your attitude is a six, people around you aren't going to have eight level attitudes. They're going to have five and four. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if your passion for your work is a, is a seven, you're not going to have eights and nines reporting to you. Theirs is going to be six and five. So it starts with you as a leader. Right. And so you tend to draw people who are excited like you are. Well, you know, I work with companies in fast growth and organizations, and that's because I realized early on that people in fast growth have something ticking upstairs and they're pretty interesting people and I like being around them and it's exciting. So why not just work with them? So um, p some of these businesses in fast, fast growth, I, I'm thinking about the caricature in my mind. Here you have these businesses, fast growth, making a lot of money. The reason they make all that money is because they hate people. That they're people, you know right. what I mean? Like right. they're, they're, like you hear the stories about Amazon and stuff. Amazon's like the worst company ever to work for. I'm yeah. not saying that. I have right. no idea. I have no idea. But, either. But you hear that and people say, yeah, they're just in it for the money and this sort of thing. Does that mean your experience? Well, companies that win. So first of all, I don't work for Amazon. So I don't work for these massive, you know, multi-billion dollar juggernauts. So I can't speak to that. But, you know, anyone that's winning in the mid market, say from five to $500 million in sales is winning because they've got an awesome culture. Typically, you don't win with weak people like an Amazon uh, has an online strategy that's probably not very people focused and they don't need a whole lot of people, but, uh, you know, relative to what they sell. Mm. But if you've got a regular business, uh, business owners, uh, you know, I hear this too in the Christian community about, you know, uh, these people are jerks and stuff like that. And they just care about money and stuff. And I, I'm sure those people are out there, but you, you don't win by, by showing a lack of integrity. I, I find more often the business people that I work with humble me who are Christians because the dedication they show, the passion they have for their people, for what they do is amazing and exemplary. And they give away and lots and they live like mice in so many, you know, yeah. situations. So does that mean they never uh, terminate people? Well, hey, we all have two jobs as Christians. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love doesn't mean soft. Love sometimes means honest. Love means I'm going to engage and confront because it's actually maybe easier to just let you drift. But I care enough that I want to confront on this behavior. So love isn't soft for sure. Yeah. One of your goals, one of the things I've learned a lot from you is that uh, we tend to shrink back from giving honest feedback. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes the reason we shrink back from it is because we don't hurt anybody's feelings, we don't right. be rude, or these sorts of things. And so ultimately, the teams that we're on often often uh, falter because the people who you have this really strong opinion about and you're frustrated with, you never say it, and then it ends up becoming kind of a passive aggressive thing, and right. you don't put the, but they don't, and they don't know why they're not being included in the discussions or why you don't value them because you never told them. And oftentimes it's either they're in the wrong seat or they're just not the right fit for the company. And in some right. ways you're actually doing them a favor by by saying to them, look, this is not working. Yeah. Um, and we need we need to do something different. How do you give that feedback, Trevor? Like what do you use you use some diagrams and some stuff that I think yeah. is really helpful. What do you what do you do? If you're gonna sit down with how often do you give feedback to employees or how that how do, how do you how much do you advise people to or and what kind of clarity can they bring? How do they do that? Okay. Well, let me say first that um, uh, the, the way you bring your feedback is really important. So if you sit down and say, this has to end, I'm done with this, I'm mad, unless it's an outrageous you know, thing, which sometimes that happens, you're not going to get a, a, a lot of progress. But if you sit down in a spirit of empathy and you say, I'm concerned, I value you, I value the relationship, I want you to win. And I see a roadblock. Like, could we talk about it? Because this is going to be a roadblock here or anywhere you go. Let's just have a discussion. Here's what I see from my perspective. What do you see? Let's start talking about it. That's the first approach to me. Right. And you can't, it, the challenge there, I would think, would be being defensive. I mean, especially if you've let things build up for a while right. in your heart that you're not willing to engage in a conversation. You just want the conversation so you can rant right. at them like you ranted to your wife about them just, yeah. you know, hours ago. Right. Or something like that. But when you get together with them, and say, say it's an employee and you got and you have a good discussion and you've identified some some stuff, uh, you you tend to use a quadrant principle. Is that something that you can describe on without drawing it? Sure. Yeah, I, I just use a simple tool that I call Coach and Connect. I think that uh, the old style performance review, call you in the principal's office, give you a grade once a year, is dead. We're all looking for coaching and mentorship and conversations that move us forward. So yeah, in my Coach and Connect, it's just what's working for you in the last quarter? What's the dim spots? What's not working for you? Some basic conversation and then just saying, let's see how you're doing. Is that a long conversation, Trevor? Other, you know, it, I suggest you do it between two and four times a year. The more frequently you do it, the shorter they are. Hmm. 20 minutes? It's quick. And we're talking about not operational details. We're talking about like, how are things working for you here? What's your future here? So your goal is, is yeah, understanding how they're feeling in their role and how you feel about them in their role currently. Right. And it's just, just to spread away any of the leaves and just say, right. this is what... This is what we both are agreed upon. Yes. If and I don't do this, what's the danger? Yeah, and, and what do we do next? Um, so let me describe how relationships break down in my view, okay? So first, we stop communicating because uh, maybe we just don't have a, a communication rhythm. Maybe we're just super busy. Or maybe I just don't like you. You're a detail person and I'm not. And the reason, you know, we're always the hero of our own story. So the reason I do what I do is because, well, it needs to be done. The reason you're so picky is because you're evil or maybe you're evil. Like, I, don't, I don't talk to evil people. So we stop communicating. When communication stops, we all start making ungracious assumptions about each other. You know, the, the reason you do this is because you're, you're a bad person. So I don't want to talk with bad people. And then trust starts to erode. And when trust erodes on your team, now you're circling the drain. Right. So, so my rule of thumb is uh, if you want to have a better relationship, any relationship, go back to communication. Start talking right. about where things are at and how they can be better. So is that common in a workplace that you get to? Like when you hear people talk about their workplaces or the ones that you deal with, I mean, you're dealing with companies in fast growth, so I'm assuming that it is a, a priority communication, but uh, is that a problem in a lot of businesses, the well, communication? One of the top two complaints I virtually always get when I start with a new place and I do some surveying is uh, one of the top two things is always communication. Like, 
What, why did that decision get made? What's my future here? How come that person got hired? Uh, you know, those sorts of questions, just basic communication things. And that's one of the first things you have to start working on. Right. Why do people stay at their jobs? Are there reasons? Uh, like in your experience, people will stay at a job for a long time because? I, I like and be fulfilled in the yes. job? Yeah, let's assume they're fulfilled. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they, fulf they feel fulfilled because they're in a role that takes advantage of their strengths. They, they're receiving some mentorship. They feel like there's runway that they can progress and grow in their strengths and get further autonomy, get better at something that they feel is worth getting better at. You know, they feel appreciated. So if I'm a frustrated uh, employee, would you just flip those on their head then and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in a role that I'm not feeling good about or that maybe doesn't fit me? That's actually been one of the things that I've been really helped by is the idea that you, that, uh, yeah, the role, I mean, I, my, my image in my mind is not one that you gave because mine's worse. I'm sure you have a better <laughs> image, but, uh, I sometimes think that same th I sometimes think that we ask people who are in our organizations to throw with their left hand, but they're not left-handed. Right. And when I throw with my left, I'm righty. When I throw with my left hand, it really looks weird right. and inefficient, and the ball's lobbed. It's not, it's very off. You know, it's I'm, it's not to its target. Yeah. But sometimes we ask people, okay, I need you to keep throwing left-handed. Why right. can't you do this? Right. Why can't you throw the ball? And there, it's just not something that's that's in them. That they're just made up. They're not made for this kind of work. And so you're a you're a proponent of some personality inventory stuff. What what right. do you use? I use a, a tool called DISC. It's a four quadrant tool. There's many great tools out there. That's just one of them that that I use. But you know, it it just says just what you're saying. Like, you know, we're we're all good at a couple of things. Uh, we all suck at a whole bunch of other things. And so when you go home at night and you feel like that was that was magnificent that day. I feel energized and enthused and excited. What were you doing that day? Or when you go home and you feel wiped and tired and exhausted, what were you doing that day? Those are clues as to what are you naturally wired to do? Because we're all just going to get better and better at the things that we're naturally wired to do. So get in the right stream. So the four quadrants are DIS, D-I-S-C? Right. So what is a D? So that's a dominant person, you know, uh, goal-oriented, uh, uh, deadline-oriented, sometimes insensitive, but really push things to the finish line. Right. And those tend to be people, I'm assuming, in the kind of CEO leadership sort of thing. Is that tend to be the case? Or people who are Ds serve in all sorts of places? Well, they serve in all sorts of places. But but just to, you know, to give some perspective, I work with about 20 companies on a regular basis. And, and all of them have uh, a person with a significant amount of, of, of D or dominant in them. Yeah. Right. So uh, would you advise somebody who has a, a dominant uh, approach? Would you would you advise somebody who, like, if they test on the disc and they got high D, would you advise them to avoid certain kinds of work? Well, you know, it, it um, you'll find you'll find D people in every job at every level of the organization. That's one thing. You know, then do you have some skills? Do you have intelligence? Do you have ambition and drive? Like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have those things. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're a dominant person, you're going to be impatient. I would say, is grief counseling for you? Uh, maybe you want to rethink that. Yeah. So yeah, you know, go somewhere where, hey, this is goal oriented and I'm achieving and I'm primarily task focused, not people focused. Yes. Is that a bad thing to not be people focused? Well, you know what, this is what we, we, you know, all of us have uh, pieces of each of these in us. So all of us are a blend of these different things. But communication often breaks down when, when you know, we, we look at life through our own lenses and we think anybody who's different from us is bad. So if you're an S, that's a person who is supportive, who is caring, empathetic, would give the shirt off their back. They don't love conflict. You put them in a situation where they're working with a D and they might think that person's a monster. Like all they care about is getting stuff done and task. They're an evil person. I don't want to communicate with them. But the truth is God has made us all different and for different purposes and for different jobs. So once you understand that about each other, uh, communication gets a whole lot better, e even in a marriage or anything. So it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not something that you would make some sort of moral judgment about, no, right? No, And yet that's our temptation. It's, 
because okay, I'll be honest. You just mentioned the two different kind of styles that I I I am a high high D. Yeah. And my wife is like almost off the charts with the S, which is funny. Right. In which is marriage. Which is the most common situation, by the way. Right in marriage. Yeah. We we God has a sense of humor. I know. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. W- which is funny though, because you know, the way we, we would approach a situation oftentimes is I'm like, don't care about what they think. Listen, we got to get this thing done. Look, th- here's the truth of the matter. We just right. stand on the truth and we're right. going to move forward on the truth. And if they don't like it, they can get lost. And by the way, I will die on my island here because <laughs> right. I am right. So if I have to die here alone, I'm prepared to do that. Right. But somebody who is an S, like my wife, she'll she'll be like, oh, but what about this person and that other person and how they feel about that person? I'm just really concerned that we're going to let these people down. Right. And I'm like, don't, you know, don't doesn't matter to me. But so sometimes there's that feeling in her mind. It's like, well, you are a monster. You're right. horrible. Right. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm a monster? I want to get the thing done so everyone can flourish. Right? Right. But she's like, no one's going to flourish unless, you know, we take care of them and pet them along the way. And I'm like, oh, stop. Right. And she's probably right, too, in some respects, yes. right? So everybody's needed. Everybody's needed. In, in, especially in organizations. But getting them in a place that takes advantage of their style and their gifts and their abilities is really a key thing. That's huge. Uh, I believe that 70% of your HR problems, your relational problems, personality conflicts and stuff like that are rooted in DISC. Yeah. So if you figure out kind of, you know, um, uh, where you're strong, where areas of weakness are for you, we start to have a whole lot more grace for each other. Understanding that God has wired us all differently. And if, you know, it, it turns out Sesame Street is right. Like if we didn't have the cooperation, it really wouldn't work. Yeah. Like, please give me a detail person as our accountant. Like if you have some C, you know, if you don't yeah, I want to know the number. So D is dominant. I is inspiring. So that's that outgoing, chatty, uh, ideas oriented person. Kind of artistic. Yeah, often performers, dreamer. You know, they're late. They lack focus. They they're poor with detail. Right. That person. And the S is a highly supportive. Supportive. Yeah. yeah. Caring, all that stuff. We talk about them. And then the C is the details person, conscientious. They want to get things right, structure, process, yeah. detail, all that stuff. They're the most irritating people on the planet. <laughs> well, the S's are great. The people are high S. I let you, of course you love them. Who's not going to love the high S's? And the eyes, all oh, they dream about all great things. And I'm a D, so I'm like, let's go get it. But those C's are like the living handbrakes. They're like every single thing has got to be, every I's got to be dotted and T crossed. I don't care. Well, you know, a C is great for uh, with quality control. They spot deficiencies first. They're accurate, thorough, precise. They pre- they they uh, they come to life from a perspective of caution, and sometimes it might come across as like, "Hey, wet blank." But really, what the motive is is I want to get things right. And I'll say, um, you know, the, some of the C's that I work with are incredibly smart. Like mm-hmm. they're they're uh, they're analysts. They can spot. Um, uh, they, you know, they can spot opportunities in spreadsheets. Like they're, they're often uh, very smart. They can t- take things apart. They can put things back together, systems and processes and structures. Sometimes though, they can take themselves apart and, uh, you know, think, shoot, I don't even measure up to my high standards. Yeah. Cause they do have such high standards. Yeah, and they tend to, they tend to see the the weakness before they see the the strength, but that's because they want to improve. They spot deficiencies yeah, first. They're, they're wired to do that. Remarkable. One of the things that I've learned is that when you, when you understand, you know, the different kind of makeup of people, and by the way, the disc stuff is it's just a tool, yeah. right? It's just cool. a tool to help yeah. help us kind of broadly understand that people yeah. are different, and sometimes they're wired a little bit different. But it's been a great help to me to understand. Uh, the way different people function. We at Northview have gone through the disc thing. We we put everyone's disc score actually has on their desk, which right. is funny. Right. Which is actually kind of helpful. Then a couple times where I've gone up to somebody and had a peek at it and thought, okay, so I'm gonna have to approach this a little softly. Yeah. Because this person is just a high S, and they just want to be in. A, you know, oftentimes they want this to be a conversation relationship that we are going right. to develop. But if somebody who's a high D, I'm like, like me, I'm like, right, this is going to take two seconds. Got it? Right. Here's the two seconds version. They're like, good. And I'm like, good. Oh, and I yeah. walk away thinking it was the best meeting I've had in years. Right. And it was maybe completely ineffective because they're thinking like, we haven't built trust. Like, no. I don't know you at all. Like, you're, you know, 
So, so I, you know, to me, love is saying, I'm going to take some time to speak to you in your language. You know, it's no different in a marriage where, you know, many of us are with people who are, who are different than us. And if you care about your spouse and you love your spouse, if, you know, when, when we first married, my wife, she's, we're both changing as we age, but she was very high C, very detailed. I was pretty high, uh, inspiring. So, you know, kind of a wing nut, but we both had a pretty high dominant score. So we're both deadly serious about being both, you know, detailed and spontaneous. Yeah. And we did a lot of fighting when yeah. we were first together uh, uh, until we figured out God actually made us different. Like you're not evil, um, nor do you have bad motives. We just need to communicate better here and, and take advantage of the strengths that each Well, and that in and of itself might very well be the, the source of uh, fixing relational fractures. Because like you said earlier, there is a, it, we tend to put moral language in it. Yeah. Like I don't like Joe who works with me. Right. And it's because he's wicked, awful, terrible. Right. And yet, actually, he cares a lot about the business as well. Maybe he is wicked, awful, ter- yeah. terrible, but he cares a bit about the business. He cares about his work just like I do. It's just that he approaches it in a very different way. And maybe he's in a role that doesn't suit him, Yeah. Uh, where his gifts and his wiring just don't don't match that. But yeah. And we're Christians, so we assume that we all carry this human stain of original sin. So, you know, there are parts of your coworker that are sinful and and bad as there are with you. And, you know, I sometimes think of it as like, we're, um, we're like porcupines trying to warm up on a cold winter's night. The closer we get together, the more we poke each other. Yeah. And this is just reality. But, but, uh, places where things work out, it's not because everyone changes so much. It's because, uh, we start to have more grace for each other yeah. and just recognize, Hey, I'm dealing with a super high conscientious person who's under a lot of stress. I know under stress, they're going to get pickier. So I just need to have grace for them right now. Right. You like doing this? You know, I kind of do. Yeah, it's pretty good. What's the best part of it? Um, I, I love the pastoral part of connecting and relating to people and hearing their stories and speaking into their life. And I love growth. I love being around anything that's growing. It's exciting and I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I can imagine. Um, I said that you need to come prepared to ask me a question. <laughs> you didn't ask one. You didn't even think of one. Trevor. Oh, I do. Oh, I thought. I thought. You know, my first thought was like, "What's your, you know, most embarrassing secret sin?" But then I thought maybe that's a little <laughs> heavy. Um, you know what? I, I'm the type. You would of, say I'm so the I'm type just, of person. I'm like, just well, going to keep going. Yeah. Or you know, uh, you know, which which person on the elders board do you really dislike most? Daryl Crop. A good one. There's no, a, just kidding. It's the chair of the elder board. <laughs> See, I shouldn't have asked. Oh, I loved, I love him. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me throw you a, a, a little more of a softball. We've used lots of these tools in the staff. Which one have you found useful, if any? Oh my word. So that's like asking me, uh, you know, which player on Arsenal I like, <laughs> like all of them. I mean, there are some of them that are, aren't quite as great as others, but like, honestly, so... If you had to pick out one that you said, here's one that, that should be used, what would it be? Uh, but your Coach and Connect stuff, I think, is enormously helpful, but maybe that's because I'm wired as somebody who likes to bring clarity to things, right. and I don't, I don't like it when we use... Uh, I mean, even in preaching and stuff, I don't like Christian speak. I don't like... I, like, half the time I go to these meetings where pastors get together, and they talk about how you know, that they're going to love on each other and they're going to lean into this. or, or And I, right. I don't know what that means. The jargon, right. I yeah. don't know what it means to love on you. Right. So It's a I, bit creepy. It is creepy. And yeah. I just want people to just say what you mean. Right. Be clear about it so that I understand. So I find myself in lots of meetings keeping asking, so what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? It drives people crazy. But... I find in the relationships and in a workplace and with, you know, pastoral ministry, it's really helpful to have regular updates with people, give them feedback when I notice something that they do well. I mean, I've tried to take what you've done and tried to incorporate it just, I've tried to do it so that there are moments where it's not formal even. Right. Like if I see something that I like that you did, I'll tell you, I really appreciate that. And if I see something that I wish would be fixed, I would come to you and say, so I, I just want to talk really quickly about this thing. I, right. I understand that perhaps you, you know, the way that you're doing it is, can you just explain to me what's going on? Because here's how it comes off, right? And I, f- I have found more people are like, oh, I didn't mean that. Or, yeah, I'm just having a rotten day. 
and you know my my dog whatever or or I I just I'm not sure what to do with my kids right now and it leads into these oh so that's the issue right it's not it's not actually that you don't like your job and whatever and you get to have an opportunity to try to help them in that but that regularity of communication and feedback is huge. I, I prefer getting it that way. Like if you said, Jeff, don't do that anymore. In fact, I, one of our uh, women who used to work for us, she's great, Cecilia Steenkamp, who was our executive assistant for a while. She was South African, and so she had it, that it, like it was her birthright to tell you exactly right. what she thought right. of everything you did. And I loved it because if I said something or did something in a sermon, she would say, don't ever do that again. <laughs> Don't ever do that. And by the way, if you say it in the moment, it doesn't land very heavy. But if she saved that up and it's once a year, call you in the principal's uh, office, and then she says, you know what, back in March, that thing you did, like, wow, that's a big deal now. Right. And now you've got you've got 10 of these? Yes. That you're going to share with me now? Yeah. So I, I'm a big fan of like the, the two-minute conversation. Like, you know, I didn't love how that meeting ended. I just wanted to talk to you. I value the relationship. What did you mean by that? Like, let's just straighten it up before we go home for dinner here. Right. And I... Th- I think my, my fear is when I say that, some people will hear it and say, yeah, I need to give like the corrective feedback to people more often. Actually, I think you need to give the positive feedback yeah. to them more often. Like people are driven more by carrots than sticks. Absolutely. And I and I think if you can if you see something that someone is doing well in your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, we Christians should be the people who have the sweetest words. I right? Agree. They're like honeycomb. They're healing to the bones. Yes. Caring precedes confronting. Right. Look at you with your little... Check that your out. Your little C's. That's stolen from John Maxwell, actually. <laughs> Dang it. But who did he steal it from? It's somebody else. Somebody else. Yeah. Trevor, thank you so much for being here. God bless you and all the things that you're doing. I will continue to learn many things from you, Sensei. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. It's great <laughs> to be here. It's great to have you guys join us. We'll see you next time. Trevor wouldn't want me to saying this, but he has a website, gettingpeopleright.com. He's got tons of resources that you can go and you can uh, take his, some classes. You can do all sorts of other things on there. You can figure out exactly what kind of tools that he uses in order to give people feedback and all sorts of things. So we really want to commend that to you. Uh, he doesn't want to make any money off it because you're all Christian people and he only likes money from people who aren't Christians. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Jeff. Make sure you subscribe to catch up on all upcoming episodes. So until next time, love God, do what you want, and don't be stupid. Mm